Well, I mean, the first time you say, hey, I'm a guy who's writing a book. You're the dorky person who's like, I'm writing a novel about Iraq. It's about a female soldier. And I wondered if I could talk to you and ask you these things. You know, I mean, basically, you just say what you're doing. Um, and some people are going to react with interest to that. And some people are going to give you really short answers that you can tell, oh, this isn't going to be all that helpful. And some people are going to embrace that project and be interested in it. And I, I felt like, uh, you know, because I talked to lots of women, but these three ended up being people who like, were interested in the narrative. They had, Stacy had done a lot of reading about uh, women in the military and in combat over time, like historically. So she was interested in this as like a narrative and knew that she was doing something unique in the way that she had participated in Iraq and in the military. Uh, and so she felt like this story was important to tell. And so she wanted to participate in that way. And so I felt like in each case, those women had a, like a specific story that they, they wanted to tell. They were aware of narrative and they wanted to sort of participate. And I could tell that they were going to be patient enough to put up with me calling them all the time and asking innumerable interminable questions. And that is really, that's a really good question. How, how do you do that? I have so many daydream. You have, just have sort of daydreams. You start imagining scenes and you write, I write hundreds of scenes that then get thrown away. Uh, and those are all just the product of daydreaming. Like what would be an interesting scene? I, you know, uh, I need something about her past. What would she, what do I know about her past? And for whatever reason, that scene of all the ones that I threw away seemed true and important and like a core. And I kept like, I, I do all my first drafts on a typewriter instead of a computer, which I think helps with daydreaming in a sense. Not because it's, it's not for style reasons. It's just that when you're typing, you don't have a screen in front of your face. And so, you know, if you daydream, you know, your eyes unfocused and you sort of go inside your head and you're trying to see stuff. The typewriter is easier than with the screen of a computer. So I had typed up that scene very, very early on and I had it with me. You know, I just kept it over. I mean, it took me eight years to write this book. So I had that scene all the time. Those little bursts of intuition are what, when you strike something that's solid and real, you just hold on to it, you know? And so the beginning of, of writing a book for me is just waiting to find one of those, you know? We have a sort of sine wave, right? Attitude toward combat and how we think about combat. And we have two sides. There's a sort of Janus based approach toward thinking about war. A large part of American culture thinks about war as a redemptive thing that we do. It's horrible but it also makes us men. And it's a very gendered thought, okay? And you've heard that phrase, right? And so we have a tremendous amount of narrative that is all about that. Not only all of the World War II, you know, the Dirty Dozen, you know, films, right? But all of our action hero films are based on that same premise. Star Wars is based on that same premise. Uh, so that idea of proving your character through combat is what I call aspirational war narratives. And I believe that aspirational war narratives are very dangerous and um, tend to make the, when they come, become ascendant, they tend to make it a lot easier for us to get into war. So in the 90s, in this sine curve of things, like we, World War II, post-World War II, high aspirational war narratives, Vietnam, and coming out of Vietnam, the filmmakers and writers and nonfiction writers who, who wrote about Vietnam worked very hard to deconstruct and destroy the aspirational war narratives of the World War II era. And they, they held sway against the idea that war was going to be a positive national activity for a very long time. And consequently, we weren't involved in a lot of wars in, in the 70s and 80s, right? And then after the Gulf War, the aspirational war narrative began to take hold again. And if you look at films like Forrest Gump or We Were Soldiers, which is a Mel Gibson movie that was made, uh, it's a Vietnam War era movie, but it's a pro, sort of pro-Vietnam War aspirational 
uh, war movie. Um, and then the return to sort of greatest generation narratives like Band of Brothers and Flags of Our Fathers in the 90s were to me deliberately and some the filmmakers and some some of the writers themselves would say directly like I didn't Hollywood got it wrong during the Vietnam era here's how war really is and they were feeding that aspirational war narrative those those kinds of narratives made it a lot easier in my personal opinion for us to invade Iraq in 2003 and those narratives will make a comeback again after now that these wars are over, the farther that you get away from the actual like horrors and complications of combat, the more people want to simplify it and make it into a pretty story. And uh, without narratives that specifically document why that is not true, you know, you're never going to hold back the aspirational war narrative forever. It's like a zombie ideology, right? But uh, the more that you fight against it, you fight against it through narrative. And I feel like that's what I am trying to do with this book and other war writers who write skeptical books are hopefully doing that.